The story kicks off as Hikaru spots a powerful beam of light shooting out from a building. Alarms blare inside, and the guards are freaking out after realizing something seriously important has been stolen. The thief is named Aki, and she makes an acrobatic escape, but the guards catch up to her on the roof. But Aki's no ordinary thief, she's a mecha yud host. So she whips out her weapon and starts taking them down, but they're packing anti mecha yud gear. Despite her best efforts, she's captured, and another host steps in, ready to reclaim the stolen cube. Aki's mecha yud isn't staying quiet it speaks up insulted by how poorly its kind is treated. The blue-haired guy couldn't care less, seeing mecha yud as nothing more than tools for humans. He retrieves the cube and taunts Aki, but she's not done yet. With some tricks up her sleeve, she breaks free, and an epic battle ensues. The guy demands she be captured, but Aki is too quick and agile. In the chaos, she knocks the cube loose, breaking its container. Then a massive surge of power erupts from it, the same light Hikaru saw earlier. As the energy flares, Hikaru feels something strange, like a voice calling out for help. The next day, Hikaru heads to school, still shaken by what he saw. On the train, he suddenly has a panic attack and tries to rush back home, but his friends show up, unknowingly stopping him. Nearby, Iki is getting scolded for all the chaos she caused. She's told the cube is still somewhere nearby, and she promises not to mess up again. Later, we see Hikaru telling his friends about the strange voice he heard and the bright light from the night before. He explains that after getting a closer look, the building exploded. He even recorded it on his phone, but for some reason, the video shows nothing. Hikaru also mentions seeing something bright fall nearby, but that's not in the footage either. His friends don't believe a word of it, dismissing his story as some weird dream. They mock him for believing in ghosts, but then out of nowhere, Hikaru hears the voice again, and he's left in shock. Hikaru charges toward the mysterious voice only to be stopped by some badass cop who warns him. He's nearing a restricted area. The cop tells him to go home, but then just leaves him there like it's no big deal. Ignoring the warning, Hikaru hears the voice again, crying out for help. Something inside him snaps, and he dashes into the restricted zone, desperately searching for the source. His frantic search leads him to a glowing cube, the voice coming from within it asking for help again. Hikaru is now shocked but curious so he ends up touching the cube anyway. The cube suddenly shoots straight up into the sky, and now Hikaru is in a state of extreme panic when he sees it come back down, but before it touches him, it unleashes a massive burst of power. The light is blinding, so intense that even Aki wherever she is notices it. Hikaru however has bigger problem. A giant arm suddenly sprouts out of his back, and the arm is celebrating its freedom. Even weirder, Hikaru can't feel the arm at all. Then while he's still trying to figure out where the voice is coming from, the arm casually reveals itself. It thanks Hikaru for saving it and asks for his name, but Hikaru understandably losing his mind has no idea what's going on. But the arm tries to be polite and introduces itself first only to realize it's forgotten its own name. Hikaru in full panic mode tries to shake it off, but the arm is stuck to his hoodie like some clingy pet. Then before Hikaru can even process this madness, a drone shows up and declares that its target has been found. Hikaru thinking it's just some delivery drone, ignores it in his attempt to ditch the arm. But surprisingly this is not an Amazon package, it's a weapon of mass destruction, and now Hikaru has to run for his life. As he runs, Hikaru yells at the arm to leave him the hell alone and go hang out with its drone buddy, but the arm insists that Hikaru is its only friend now. In the chaos Hikaru trips, and the arm accidentally yanks his pants off. Pantsless and panicking, Hikaru still manages to use the arm to fend off the drone and stop it from slicing him in half. The arm points out with perfect timing that now is really not the time for laughing. Then to make matters worse, several more Terminator-style drones appear, so the arm trying to keep Hikaru calm tells him not to worry because they just need to work together to escape. Elsewhere, a group gets word that the trigger arm has been located. One guy's pumped to have it back, but the rest of them are losing their mind, furious that it's made contact with some random human. They're not sure who the kid is, but they figure he's just some civilian. The president of the group leaves the whole mess to the angry white rooster of a guy, who immediately orders a perimeter around the area, and his top priority is to capture the trigger arm, and he doesn't give a damn what happens to the kid. Meanwhile, Hikaru manages to hide for a moment, and the arm compliments him on being a pretty fast runner. Hikaru still freaked out, demands to know what the arm even is, but it has no clue not even its own name. The only thing it's sure of is that Hikaru's a stand-up guy. The arm goes on to explain that without something called Arbitrium, it can't move freely. So Hikaru's confused, wondering what this Arbitrium thing is, but the arm's all over the place and just asks for Hikaru's name. Hikaru still not interested in chit-chat walks off, pointing out that the arm seems to work just fine for escaping on its own. 
The arm concernedly warns that they might still be in danger, worried about Hikaru's safety. But Hikaru's not having it, he blames the arm for all the trouble, and says he'd be safer if he got far away from it. The further Hikaru gets though the more the arm starts to weaken, practically begging him not to leave it behind. Hikaru hesitates and rushes back to help, but the arm recovers just as quickly, so Hikaru tries to leave again. This back and forth goes on a few times, and it becomes painfully obvious that Hikaru has to stick close, or the arm will lose its energy completely. Realizing he's got no other choice, Hikaru reluctantly throws his hoodie back on, with the arm still attached. Just then, the drones show up again, but this time, Hikaru snaps and demands that the arm do something useful. The arm doesn't hesitate it grabs Hikaru and drags him off. Meanwhile, the blue-haired guy up top figures the drones are enough to handle this civilian, as he has to focus on Aki who's lurking nearby. Aki is down below, but surprisingly she's so terrible with directions, so the voice in her ear is trying to guide her, telling her to go the other way, but instead of taking the long way around, Eki's arms contemplate smashing through the building, but she decides to squeeze through an opening instead. Meanwhile, Hikaru is still running for his life, but Eki eventually tracks him down, and she unleashes her arms to take the drones down with ease. Aki calls Hikaru's arm Alma and threatens it, warning that if it moves, she'll end it right there. Eki's arms remind her she's supposed to read some script to put her targets at ease, but they're rudely interrupted by the blue-haired guy who's itching for revenge after last night's events. He ends up bickering with Eki's arms, of all things. Alma then points out a way for Hikaru to escape, and since Eki can't chase them with her arms out, Hikaru takes the chance. The drones of course keep coming after him, and Eki's anger skyrockets. Hikaru's already regretting the hell out of ever stepping foot in this restricted area, and the terror is written all over his face. Alma seeing the mess he's dragged Hikaru into, tells him to just leave him behind. Everyone's gunning for them, and Alma doesn't want Hikaru caught up in it any longer. Hikaru hesitates because if he leaves, Alma will lose all his strength, and this moment shows just how kind-hearted Hikaru really is. Alma's resolve strengthens, and he reminds that he never wants to see good people get hurt, so he tells Hikaru to forget everything and run as fast as he can. Just then, Aki obliterates the blue-haired guy, and she's had it with Alma's constant running. Alma cornered surrenders and agrees to do whatever Aki says, as long as she lets Hikaru go. But Hikaru's no longer the same scared kid, so he's done with being a coward, and it also would leave a sour taste in his mouth if he ran away now. Eki clearly fed up, decides she'll have to destroy both of them. But Alma does something unexpected. He tells Hikaru to step forward, but Hikaru hesitates confused, so Alma insists this is the only way out. Hikaru takes a deep breath, trusts the arm he just met, and charges forward. And in that moment, Alma undergoes a wild transformation giving Hikaru the power to land a punch on Aki so hard that all she can do is reach out helplessly as they make their escape. They crawl out of a sewer not long after, and Hikaru finally introduces himself properly this time. Back at the building, some kid collapses in fury, demanding to know who stole his mecha yud. He's seething, declaring that the trigger arm is his. Meanwhile, Aki's boss is disappointed to hear she let the arm slip away, but he gets it because no one could have predicted a civilian would manage to control Alma. Time's ticking though and their enemies will be hot on their trail, so he orders Aki back out to retrieve the arm. Later on, Hikaru heads to school, trying to act normal while hiding the fact that he's got a giant, talking arm attached to him. He then thinks he's in the clear until he walks into class, and his heart sinks when he spots Aki, now the newest student in school. Ignoring everyone the furious Aki drags her seat right next to Hikaru's seat, and introduces herself with a cold angry glare, and that shit leaves our poor boy completely speechless. Then as Hikaru tries to shrug off Aki's intense death glare, he has no idea that someone else is also keeping an eye on him. Two agents Wanner and Twos are watching him from a nearby building. They work for the Kagami group and have been assigned to recover the trigger arm by any means necessary including murder. Although Twos isn't thrilled about the idea of killing a kid, Later after class, Hikaru sneaks into the bathroom, hoping to escape Aki. He never imagined she'd actually follow him to school, but today it doesn't seem like she's looking for a fight. Hikaru figures she's trying to avoid making a scene on school ground. Regardless, Alma thinks this is their chance to talk things out. Yesterday's chaos left them no choice but to fight Aki. But thinking back, she did seem somewhat friendly at first, though Hikaru remembers it a bit differently, and his missing favorite pants a proof of that shit day. Still there aren't many people he can talk to about Alma. His options are limited, go with Aki or head to the police. Hikaru asks Alma what he thinks, but Alma is too busy having fun messing with the toilet paper to really care. However Aki who had been eavesdropping from the next stall cuts in, 
She tells Hikaru that going to the police is a terrible idea they'd hand him straight over to Kagami. She then climbs over the stall and tells Hikaru she's here to be his bodyguard. But Hikaru flustered by how close she is in the boy's restroom, panics and bolts out the door, with a key chasing after him. Later after losing a key, Hikaru is having lunch with his friends, but given how Aki has been relentlessly chasing him lately, his friends are starting to think he might be in a relationship with her or something. Hikaru denies it, but his weak protests aren't exactly convincing especially when Aki shows up on the roof, looking for him yet again. Hikaru's friends call Aki over, pointing out that he's right there, but in that very moment, Hikaru seems to have disappeared. Somehow he managed to slip away and hide in the blink of an eye. Alma confused by Hikaru's behavior, wonders why he's dodging Aki when they'd already agreed to try talking to her. But just then one of Hikaru's classmates shows up on the roof, clearly having searched for Aki all over. She introduces herself as Meru, all smiles, and says it's nice to finally meet Aki. But Aki's reaction is not exactly warm and fuzzy. Meru being as cheerful as ever, mistakes Aki's cold expression for nerves after all she's the new kid. So by trying to make things less awkward, she offers Aki a tray of cookies as a welcome gift. Hikaru braces himself, half expecting Aki to blow up, but to his shock, Aki seems completely mesmerized by the cookies, and without a second thought, she grabs a fistful and shoves them into her mouth. Meru a little taken aback by how fast Aki inhaled the cookies, is happy her gift was appreciated. She then asks if they can be friends, and Aki still chewing, casually says she doesn't mind. Watching this unfold, Hikaru is stunned because Aki seems way more normal than he had initially though. But that doesn't mean he's about to strike up a conversation with her. So he slips on his noise-canceling headphones and decides to nap his way through the rest of the day hoping to avoid her. Meanwhile, as Aki continues devouring the cookies, Maru starts asking about her relationship with Hikaru. That's when Aki suddenly remembers she was supposed to be looking for him this whole time. Wanting to be helpful, Maru comes up with a plan to get Aki alone with Hikaru. Later that day, while Hikaru is trying to make a quiet exit from school, Meru appears out of nowhere and hands him a handwritten letter from Aki. Hikaru already knows where this is headed, and as he predicted Aki wants to meet him. Maru fully convinced she's playing matchmaker, drags Hikaru to an abandoned part of the school, refusing to let him leave because she's certain Aki is about to confess her love. Frustrated and out of options, Hikaru steps into the classroom where Aki is waiting and immediately starts yelling at her for getting Meru involved in this whole mess. Aki completely unbothered denies everything, explaining that this was all Meru's idea. Still Hikaru points out that she's been following him around all day and demands to know what her deal is. Finally, Aki cuts to the chase, revealing that she's part of an organization called ARMS and her mission is to watch over Alma as his bodyguard. Alma thinks this is fantastic news after all Aki protecting them sounds like a win. But Aki quickly clarifies, saying her job is to protect Alma not Hikaru. She isn't too concerned with what happens to Hikaru, but since Alma is linked to him, there's not much she can do to separate them. As part of her mission, she's supposed to bring both of them back to headquarters. She assures Hikaru that nothing will happen to him as long as he cooperates. And while Alma sees this as great news, Hikaru remains skeptical, because he's still not sure if Aki can be trusted. Alma understands Hikaru's hesitation, but insists that Aki knows something important about him, something they need to find out. Alma is still curious about who he is, and Hikaru feels bad for him, so Hikaru reluctantly agrees to go with Aki, even though he doesn't fully trust her. But before committing though, Hikaru demands to know why Alma loses power whenever he moves too far away from him. After witnessing this firsthand, Aki's mind short circuits for a moment. In her experience, a mecha yud fusing to something as simple as a jacket shouldn't be possible, and there's no intel on anything like this. She then steps closer to Hikaru, telling him she needs to take him in for testing but her sudden aggression freaks him out. So Hikaru panickedly asks Alma if there's any way they can get out of this. Alma tries to use the same power they'd unleashed on Aki the day before. There's a massive flash of light, but nothing happens because Alma's still too weak, so that leaves Hikaru with only one option. He grabs Alma and bolts, running as fast as he can. Hikaru heads for the front door, but just as he's about to escape, Meru steps in his way blocking the exit, and she tells him he should finish talking to Aki before she lets him leave. Meanwhile, outside the building, Doos and Wanner are keeping a close watch on the entrance, but since there's a schoolgirl standing outside, they can't make a move without blowing their cover. Inside Hikaru frantically searches for another way out, but all the other exits have been boarded up, so with no options left, it looks like his only choice is to head up. Meanwhile, Aki is desperately trying to track him down. Dex her right arm chimes in, saying she should head down the right hall, while Sinny's her left arm, argues she should go left. 
but surprisingly Aki ignores both of them and goes rogue literally. She smashes through the floor, crashing directly on top of Hikaru. Now there's no escape for Hikaru, but Aki can't wrap her head around why Hikaru's running when he literally spared her life just yesterday. Hikaru then tries to explain by saying that he could never kill anyone, but Aki's not hearing it anymore. She's convinced he's up to something shady, using Alma as part of his scheme. Alma tries to defend him, claiming Hikaru's not the bad guy here, but Aki's too far gone in her suspicions, so Alma tries to use his powers to protect Hikaru, but when Alma's powers fail to activate again, Aki takes it as undeniable proof Hikaru isn't bonded with Alma, so her mind's made up that Hikaru's gotta go, and she's ready to end it all to protect Alma. But of course this is when Meru bursts in, drawn by all the noise. And wouldn't you know it, she catches a glimpse of the scene and immediately jumps to the wrong conclusion, thinking she's interrupting a private moment, so she awkwardly turns around and leaves without a word. And as soon as she's gone, Eki moves in to finish the job, but Hikaru's already vanished, forcing her to start the hunt all over again. Once Eki's out of sight, Hikaru quietly gets to his feet and tries to slip out through the front door, but he's stopped by Wanner, who's now wearing one of those Kagami group uniforms, instantly putting Hikaru on high alert. Wanner casually says he needs Hikaru's help, but seriously after the Kagami group nearly killed him with drones, Hikaru's in no mood to offer any favor. Wanner then offers a half-hearted apology, claiming the drones were a mistake, but he's really only sorry they didn't finish the job, and without warning, he blasts Hikaru with a sonic cannon. It doesn't physically harm him, but Hikaru drops to his knees, overwhelmed by dizziness. Wanner then kicks the door open to give Tuz a clear shot, but like an idiot, he's blocking her view. But by the time he steps aside, Alma has already dragged Hikaru out of range. Even though Hikaru's still reeling, the danger is far from over, so he scrambles back inside, desperate to escape the nightmare. Tuz is pissed at Wanner for screwing up her shot, so she decides to stop wasting time and starts blasting through the walls, hoping to nail Hikaru. Hikaru is freaking out, sure that she's going to kill him, but Alma has something else on his mind. Even though Wanner's using a mecha yud, Alma can't sense any consciousness from it which is seriously weird. Right then Wanner hits Hikaru with another sonic wave, and Hikaru crashes at the end of the hallway. But just as Tuz takes her shot, Eki swoops in saving his life at the last second. Not backing down, Wanner fires off another sonic wave, so Eki tries to block it. But just like Hikaru, she gets dizzy and drops to the ground. Wanner is loving every minute of this because he lives for making people suffer. But Eki not going down that easy, so she pushes herself back up, determined to protect Alma, and she begs Hikaru to run while he still can. Hikaru hesitates, not wanting to leave Aki to fight alone, but she begs him to go because they can't let the Kagami group get their hands on Alma. Hikaru finally listens, dashing away while Aki keeps Wanner busy. But of course Wanner's not done he pulls out a new weapon, and Aki has no idea how to handle it. Meanwhile, as Hikaru races up the stairs, he grows increasingly frustrated with everyone coming after him. Then Alma stops him and says they shouldn't leave Aki behind after all, but Hikaru reminds him that Eki told them to run to protect Alma. But Alma's not feeling it. He doesn't want to abandon her. So he leaps off Hikaru's back and punches a hole through the wall for Hikaru to escape. But when Alma tries to go back to help Eki himself, he quickly loses power because he can't move too far from Hikaru. Realizing Alma can't do anything without him, Hikaru agrees to return and help. But they need a solid plan before facing Wanner and his deadly sonic cannon. Meanwhile, Wanner manages to defeat Aki by using shackles that suppress the consciousness of Mecha Yud, rendering her helpless. He then drags her to the rooftop, where Tuz is supposed to snipe her. But to Wanner's surprise, Tuz shows up in person frustrated with how long he's taking to finish the job. She then takes one look at Aki and mocks her for being so pathetic, barely able to contain her disdain. Sure Tuz would love to kill her, but she has orders to bring Aki back alive. She then tells Wanner to get back inside and find Hikaru, but that won't take long because Hikaru's already coming up the staircase right toward them. Then as soon as Hikaru spots Wanner he throws a punch, but let's be real he's no fighter and Wanner easily dodges it. Hikaru may not have fists of fury, but at least he knows Wanner's attacks won't work on him. Wanner decides to blast him anyway, but Hikaru's got noise-canceling earpieces in, making him immune to the sonic wave. His goal was just to buy enough time for Aki to get back in the game, but when he glances at her, he realizes she's been captured, and that throws a wrench in his plan, so by thinking fast Hikaru comes up with a new one. He then throws Alma at Aki, hoping to get those shackles off her mecha yud, but of course Alma starts losing power the second he's too far from Hikaru, so now Hikaru has to sprint closer and somehow Tuz who's supposed to be a sniper completely misses her shot. Alma and Hikaru manage to free Aki, 
and the moment she's back on her feet, she grabs Tooze, using her as a human shield to charge straight at Wanner. Wanner hesitates because he doesn't want to blast Tooze, but she orders him to fire for the sake of the mission. He follows through, but all he manages to do is knock Tooze out cold. So Eki wastes no time and delivers a knockout blow to Wanner as well. The building is on the verge of collapse after all the damage their fight caused. And just before it crumbles, Tooze regains consciousness and flies away, leaving Wanner to get buried in the rubble along with the others. Then we see that Eki and Hikaru make it out in one piece. But before they can catch their breath, Eki's boss from ARMS shows up, and he is not happy with the mess she made to complete the mission. They then haul Hikaru back to their headquarters, and when Hikaru finally wakes up, He's introduced to the leader of the arms group Algis and his mecha yud, Fist. Algis explains that they're in a war against the Kagami group, whose goal is to enslave all mecha yud and control them. Alma doesn't remember much about them, but Fist reveals he's actually Alma's brother, and they need his help to win this war. Alma immediately agrees to help and convinces Hikaru to join as well. But Aki and Algis cut in, telling Hikaru that they only need Alma for this fight so technically he doesn't have to stick around at all. While he was asleep, they ran tests on him to measure the levels of Arbitrium in his body. Arbitrium is the energy produced by the human mind, and it's what fuels all Mecha Yud. But when Hikaru's levels were plotted on a graph, well this is what his levels look like, and this is what a normal Mecha Yud user's levels look like. In case it wasn't already clear, Hikaru is a total failure when it comes to wielding Mecha Yud, and there's no sugarcoating it. Algis then admits that Hikaru might have been the one to awaken Alma, but he's also the reason Alma is now fused to a jacket, and on top of that, he can't even use Alma's power. Despite this disaster, they have no choice but to leave Alma in Hikaru's care for now. However Algis makes it painfully clear, Hikaru is not allowed to act on his own under any circumstances because he simply cannot handle himself. Alma then tries to defend Hikaru, pointing out that the only reason Kagami didn't capture him is thanks to Hikaru. But Quen cuts in, saying that even if that's true, the fact remains, Hikaru doesn't have the power to wield Alma properly, making him a liability. Just as things get tense, Aki interrupts saying she believes Hikaru might have the potential to draw out Alma's power after all. He did harness it the first time they met, so with some training, she's sure he can improve. And what has this training been so far? Alma doing push-ups on the school roof. Sure Hikaru's grateful Aki offered to train him, but he's seriously questioning how effective this is when Alma is doing all the work and he's just sitting there. But Aki tells him that training Arbitrium is all about spirit, so he just needs to psych himself up to make himself stronger. That's all well and good, but it still doesn't explain how exercise is supposed to boost his Arbitrium. Nonetheless, Hikaru decides to just roll with it for now. A few moments later, Eki gets a call from ARMS, telling her she has to return to headquarters immediately. So she cuts Hikaru and Alma's so-called training short and drags them back with her. Apparently, there's been a string of incidents where Mecha Yud have been ripped away from their wielders. And surprisingly, this guy is the third victim this week. Algis is convinced this has Kagami's dirty fingerprints all over it, likely the work of a new agent. So his top priority now is to recover the stolen Mecha Yud as fast as humanly possible before things go from bad to worse. Alma clueless as ever, asks what too late even means, so Dex breaks it down for him. If someone's Mecha Yud gets forcibly ripped from their body, they're dead in a few days, no question. They're not entirely sure why, but the best guess is that Arbitrium starts leaking out from the fusion point, draining the poor soul's strength until they just wither away. A lot about Arbitrium is still a mystery, but one thing's clear, it messes with the human body in ways they barely understand. For example, anyone who fuses with a Mecha Yud gets a ridiculous boost in physical ability. Not that it helps Hikaru since Alma didn't fully fuse with him, he's still just a regular guy, no superpowers for him. Aki spots some marks on the victim's arms and instantly knows the culprit used a worm-type mecha. Algis is already reading her mind, so before she can say anything, he shuts it down. Her job is to protect Alma period, with no side missions and no personal vendettas. The second Algis is out the door. Aki naturally ignores everything he just said and announces she has something she needs to investigate for personal reason. And since she's stuck babysitting Hikaru, he's tagging along whether he likes it or not. Meanwhile, over at the Kagami group, they're panicking because Jun Kagami's younger brother has stolen an experimental artificial mecha yud and vanished into thin air. No one knows what his plan is, but it's definitely not good. The third division offers to handle it, but considering they're the same clowns who let Alma escape last time, the White Ravens are given the job instead. Elsewhere, Hikaru is out with a key late into the night, and by now he's figured out she's snooping around, investigating that case even though Algis told her not to. 
Still he wonders if it's really a good idea for them to be out here alone. Aki flat out ignores him. But just then, they hear car horns blaring nearby. On the other side of the containers, they spot the White Ravens, busy searching for Kagami's younger brother. Their leader Imada orders his men to keep scouring the area, but of course that's when Aki and Hikaro show up. Hikaro as usual thinks it's a terrible idea to get involved with anyone from the Kagami group, but Aki unfazedly assures him everything will be fine as long as he sticks close and keeps Alma hidden. She steps up to Amada and casually asks if he knows anything about a worm-type mecha yud wielder. At first, they think she's just some random girl, but the second she mentions mecha yud, their mood flips. Imada and his squad go hostile, there's no way they can let the general public find out about the mechas. They charge in to capture her, and Aki's left with no choice but to fight back. She calls out Sinis and Dex for backup. Imada's taken aback when he realizes she's a mecha wielder, but orders are orders. He tells the White Ravens to regroup and attack again. Meanwhile, Hikaro gets knocked aside in the chaos, and as he's struggling to get back on his feet, he spots a young boy with an inhaler hiding in a corner. Hikaro tells the kid it's dangerous to be here and asks if he's okay, but the boy doesn't respond and instead he bolts. Hikaro has no idea who this kid is, but something doesn't sit right with him, so he takes off after the boy, leaving Aki to handle the White Raven solo. Imada noticing this, has his Mecha Joe transform into a bike, and he speeds off to chase the kid too. At the same time, a few White Raven members catch up to the kid and Hikaro. So Hikaro steps in front of the kid, ready to protect him. The White Raven guys look more than happy to beat the crap out of Hikaro if it means getting to the kid, but right before Hikaro gets smacked, Alma pops out and blocks the hit. Just then, they spot Imada and his Mecha Yud bike zooming straight toward them. Hikaro turns around to tell the kid to run, but the kid's already vanished. Imada's original target may have slipped away, but now that he's spotted Alma, he switches gears and goes after him instead. Alma quickly realizes they're in trouble, so he tries to drag Hikaro to safety. But let's be real, there's no way Alma can outrun a motorcycle. So Imada easily catches up and grabs Alma, smug as ever for capturing the trigger arm. Just when it looks like Imada's won, Aki comes out of nowhere, knocks him clean off his bike, and pins him down. She demands answers about a worm-type mecha yud wielder, and Imada and Joe not wanting to get squashed by a shipping container, reluctantly agree to cooperate. But it turns out they genuinely don't know anything about a worm-type wielder, so Aki frustratedly drops the container and lets them go. She's not happy about the dead end, but she's even more pissed at Hikaro for running off like an idiot. Hikaro tries to explain he saw a kid being chased and just wanted to help, but Aki's having none of it. She tears into him, furious that his reckless behavior almost got Alma captured. As much as she wants to believe in him, he's still powerless, and she tells him point blank that he can't do anything on his own. Meanwhile, the kid from earlier is watching everything unfold from the rooftops, clearly interested in Alma too. He's just waiting for the right moment to make his move. Back on the ground, Hikaro is just as furious with Aki. After all, she's the one who dragged him into this mess in the first place, without bothering to explain a damn thing. So why should he trust her or blindly follow her orders? And he's had enough. And if anyone's to blame for this disaster, it's her. So he tells her he's done, and he's just going to go home. Sinis and Dax then ask Aki if it's really okay to let Hikaro just walk off on his own. But she's too mad to care. She snaps that she doesn't give a damn what happens to him. As Hikaro storms away, Alma tries to talk sense into him, suggesting he go back and apologize to Aki after all. She is the one protecting them, but Hikaro flat out refuses. Then we see that Jun is lurking nearby, and thinks this is perfect. If Hikaro's beefing with his bodyguard, it'll be way easier to snatch Alma. But before he can make his move, Aki cuts him off, and despite being furious with Hikaro, she's still got a duty to keep them safe no matter what. Jun was hoping to avoid her, but since he's out of options, he brings out his mecha. Aki's blood boils when she realizes it's a warm type, so she thinks Jun is the very guy she's been hunting down. But after their first clash, Dex quickly realizes he's not the one they're after. Still that moment of hesitation is all Jun needs to surround Aki, and things are about to go south fast. Meanwhile, Hikaro is stewing over his argument with Aki when his phone rings. Alma urges him to apologize while he's got the chance. But when Hikaro checks the screen, he sees a picture of Aki knocked out cold. Jun's voice follows, telling Hikaro that he's stripped Aki of her mecha yud, and without them, she'll be dead in a few hours. So if Hikaro wants to save her, he's got to meet Jun at a specific location. So the first thing the panicking Hikaro does is call Algis to report what happened. Algis is obviously worried about Akai, but he warns Hikaro not to go after Jun because that's exactly what Jun wants. He says he'll send some agents to track them down, 
but in the meantime he orders Hikaru and Alma to stay put and not do anything reckless. Hikaru is beyond fed up with being told he's too weak to handle anything, and he's starting to believe it might be true. Alma however assures him he's capable of amazing things when he sets his mind to it, but Hikaru isn't buying it, and he argues that every brave act he's done so far has only been because of Alma's influence, so without Alma he'd still be a coward. He then admits for the first time that he's truly powerless on his own, but right now he's not alone, so he asks Alma to lend him his strength for what he's about to do. Hikaru and Alma then head over to the abandoned warehouse Jun marked on the map, and as they walk in, Jun greets them with a smug smile. Alma, not wasting time, asks why Jun's doing all of this, so Jun in typical fashion, explains that he's after the strongest mecha yud. Sure sinis and decks are decent, but compared to what he wants, they're nothing but junk. What he really wants is the trigger arm, the legendary piece that's said to grant its wielder the strongest body, and Jun's determined to claim that power for himself. So without a second thought, Jun launches his attack, forcing Hikaru to dart around the room to avoid getting flattened. Then when he spots an opening, Hikaru closes in and tries to grab sinis and decks. But Jun's always one step ahead, blocking every move with ease. Jun laughs and mocks him calling Hikaru nothing but a weakling. Hikaru doesn't argue because he knows he's weak, but that's not stopping him from doing what's right. With resolve burning in his eyes, he charges back in, managing to outmaneuver Jun just enough to break through his defenses. Frustrated beyond belief, Jun can't believe how hard Hikaru's making him work. To make things worse, his asthma starts acting up, and he's had enough. Deciding to put an end to this, he traps Hikaru inside a massive energy cage, leaving him nowhere to run. Then with no hesitation, Jun electrocutes him until Hikaru crashes to the ground, completely drained. Seizing the moment, Jun grabs Hikaru and begins ripping Alma away, pulling them apart piece by piece. At last, Jun thinks it's over he's finally got Alma, and now he can fix his broken body. But just as he begins to celebrate, Alma shockingly still moves and knocks him flat. Jun's completely baffled Mecha Yud aren't supposed to move on their own. His confusion only deepens when Hikaru, who should be on the verge of death after having his Mecha ripped out, starts moving too. Hikaru reaches out for Alma, and as soon as they touch, Alma's true power is unleashed, sending a clear message to Jun, he's in deep trouble. Jun tries forming a massive fist to knock them out, but it's pointless. Hikaru and Alma are on a different level now, and they crush his attack like it's nothing. Together, they launch a fist at Jun, and just when he thinks he's blocked it, Hikaru rushes in and finishes him off with one final, brutal punch. Jun's completely down for the count at this point. Hikaru and Alma finally think they can breathe easy, but nope, they were dead wrong. The head of the White Ravens shows up, and both Hikaru and Alma brace themselves for another fight, but the man waves it off, saying he's not getting paid to brawl with them today. He's just here to take Jun and leave. He also grabs Sinis and Dex, intending to take them too. But Hikaru steps in, declaring he's not letting the guy walk off with them. The White Raven's leader looks like he's more than ready to throw down, but Jun, still licking his wounds, stops him, saying he wants to be the one to defeat Hikaru someday. He forbids the man from harming Hikaru for now. The man, with a shrug, tosses the Mecha Yud back to Hikaru, but not without a parting warning. They'll meet again, and next time, Hikaru won't be so lucky. A little while later, Aki wakes up in a hospital with Sinis and Dex reattached to her. After learning that Hikaru was the one who saved her, she heads up to the rooftop, where Hikaru is awkwardly trying to sew Alma back onto his jacket. She sits down next to him, and there's an uncomfortable silence. Eventually, Hikaru breaks the ice and asks her what she was really searching for the night before. Aki admits she was hunting for the person who killed her family. The only clue she has is that the killer wields a worm-type mecha yud. Turns out, Jun wasn't the one. She acted impulsively because of her need for revenge, and she's grateful Hikaru saved her from herself. Wanting to repay him, she offers to sew Alma back together for him. Problem is, Aki's terrible at sewing, and Hikaru quickly tries to stop her before she makes things worse. Just as they're struggling over the needle and thread, Meru walks in with some sweets, and seeing the two of them so close, Meru is instantly struck by what looks like a romance scene, her eyes widening in shock. She squeals declaring the rom-com love has hit a new level, then runs off screaming that she loves it. Hikaru fumbles to explain, but before he can get a word out, Aki completely unfazed dives into the sweets like a maniac, happily munching away. Hikaru is now officially part of ARMS, and just a few days later, he's thrown into his first mission for the team. A couple of other ARMS members are on standby, while Hikaru clings to the top of a transport truck carrying captured Mecha Yud. When he peeks inside, he sees a nasty-looking fat guy beating up a scientist. The team had expected this, so they remind Hikaru to stick to the plan, 
set off the imp they gave him once the truck reaches the interchange up ahead. Hikaru plans to follow orders, but when Alma sees the fat man abusing his shackled mecha yud, he refuses to just stand by, so he does something reckless that causes the truck to flip over, creating a huge accident on the road. Hikaru gets out unharmed, but now he has to run for his life because Alma's outburst gave away their position, making Hikaru a target. Unfortunately, the fat man throws the entire truck in front of him, blocking his escape. Things are looking grim, so ARMS member Tani and his mecha Karex decide to lend a hand. The man then fires multiple missiles at Hikaru, who barely dodges them, but now three mechas are closing in. The fat guy then pulls out an armed cannon, aiming to turn Hikaru to ashes. But just as it seems like Hikaru's done for, Tani zooms in and snatches him to safety. Hikaru is grateful for the rescue, and Alma apologizes for causing such a mess with his impulsive actions. But they barely have time to talk before the fat man locates them again and charges in for another attack. This time though, Aki intercepts him and knocks him to the ground. She's beyond annoyed that Hikaru and Alma bungled such a simple task. So she orders Tani to get them out before they make things worse for the mission. When the fat man gets back up, he notices Iki has two mechas, but he still thinks he's got the upper hand because he's packing three. He tries to kick her, but she easily blocks it. Then he attempts to blast her, but the fool runs out of energy and passes out. Turns out, using a mecha yud takes serious stamina, and this guy clearly hasn't trained enough to handle more than one. Not surprising considering he's probably never set foot in a gym in his life. Aki then figures he won't be getting up anytime soon, so she calls in the recovery team to come pick him up. But while her back is turned, someone else sneaks in, using a warm type mecha to revive the guy. By the time Aki realizes something's wrong, the fat man's already back on his feet stronger than before. Aki is struggling to handle the guy's strength, and her chances of winning look pretty slim. But just in the nick of time, Hikaru comes charging in and knocks the guy back. Aki yells that she told him to run, but of course, Hikaru couldn't just sit by and watch her struggle, so he jumped in to help. The man then gets back up and fires his laser cannon, but Hikaru and Alma see it coming a mile away, and together, they easily deflect the blast. Then the guy tries to crush them with the truck, but Hikaru totally unfazed, charges forward and knocks him out with a single punch. When the fight's over, Tani comes up and congratulates Hikaru for doing such a solid job. Thanks to his efforts, they were able to rescue a ton of mecha yud, and Hikaru basks in the praise. But Aki seems more interested in the knocked out guy. Back at headquarters, Aki is in the shower, lost in flashbacks of her time with her sister, and the promise she made to protect her. A promise she ultimately failed to keep. And now all she has left is the drive to avenge her family. Outside the shower, a nervous scientist Aki had asked for help is waiting for her. When she finally steps out, he starts freaking out because it's the first time he's seen her right out of the shower. He quickly explains that he's just here to report on the issue Aki asked him to look into. But unfortunately they didn't get any useful info from the guy they captured. They inspected the mecha yud he was using, and none were worm types. But Eki's sure she saw a worm type, so something weird is definitely going on. The scientist trying to be supportive, tells Eki he knows she's out for revenge and promises to help her investigate with everything he's got. He even tries to convince her to rely on him instead of Hikaru. But by the time he finishes his little speech, Eki's already gone to find Hikaru. Over at Hikaru's house, Alma wakes up and realizes they've overslept, and if Hikaru doesn't get up soon, they're going to be late for school, so Alma panics and starts trying to drag Hikaru out of bed by his pants, even offering to help him change clothes if that's what it takes. But just as Alma's making a mess of things, Eki bursts into Hikaru's room through the window, seeing that he's not ready for school. She also says she'll help him get dressed whether he likes it or not because her offer is non-negotiable. Meanwhile at school, the whole class is buzzing because there's a rumor that a new transfer student is joining today, and apparently the guy's filthy rich, so naturally everyone wants to meet him. Right then the door swings open, and there's a key holding a half-naked Hikaru. Everyone immediately assumes there's something going on between the two, and Meru's mind starts running wild with all sorts of fantasies. Then once Aki sets Hikaru down, Meru casually informs the class that the new transfer student will be arriving soon. This is news to Aki as well, but just as she's processing it, a call blares over the paw system, and some guy is yelling for Hikaru to come to the roof. So Hikaru and Aki head up there, only to find Jun waiting for them. The second Sinis and Dex lay eyes on him, they immediately attack, remembering what Jun did to Aki the last time they crossed path. But Jun blocks the attack with his mecha, already annoyed by the interruption. He's about to take her down when he gets a message from Taudu, the head of the White Raven. Taudu isn't having any of it and reminds Jun that the only reason he's allowed at school is because he promised not to use his mecha. 
but here he is already breaking that promise. Jun tries to argue that Aki started it, but Taodu shuts him down because there are no exceptions. Left with no choice, Jun withdraws his mecha and surrenders. Aki is more than ready to knock him out cold anyway, but Hikaru tells her to back off since it's clear Jun doesn't want to fight anymore, so Aki reluctantly lets him go for now. Jun however swears he'll claim the trigger arm for himself eventually, but that's a mission for another day because the real reason he came to this school is Hikaru. He then says that the scientist who created his mecha told him it would take time for it to fully adapt to his body, so until he can master it, he plans to keep a close eye on Hikaru. He wants to figure out the secret behind how Hikaru can use Alma so effortlessly, and once he learns that secret, Jun vows to crush Hikaru and steal the trigger arm. Hikaru then notices that Jun keeps calling Alma the trigger arm, so he asks if Jun knows any other useful info since Alma lost his memory. But before Jun can even answer, Aki goes for the attack again. Convinced that Jun is way too dangerous to let live, she's dead serious about finishing him off, but Alma grabs her just in time, reminding her they need to get some information about Alma's past from Jun. But while they're busy fighting, Jun casually starts walking away. Before leaving, he shoots Hikaru a warning. His mecha restrictions only apply at school, so if he catches Hikaru slipping on the streets, he's not going to let him off so easy. Later that day, Aki and Hikaru are walking through the school halls together, and Aki's sticking way too close for comfort. Hikaru is starting to get seriously annoyed, so he tries to distract her by pretending there's an imaginary rice ball, just to create some space. It works for a minute, but no matter where he goes, Aki's right there practically glued to his side. Then Hikaru desperately manages to ditch her by using his actual lunch as bait, but now he's left hungry and wondering what to do. But just as he's contemplating his next move, he hears Jun's voice from above. Jun then recalls asking Taodu if he knows what makes Hikaru able to use the trigger arm without any training, and Taodu had no clue. But he then jokily says that maybe it's something in the food Hikaru eats, so now waving his black card like he owns the place, Jun says he's treating Hikaru to lunch so he can see what he's eating. Hikaru finds the offer weird, but since he wanted to talk to Jun anyway, he asks if Jun knows anything about Alma's past. But before Jun can answer, Aki kicks Hikaru's legs then she holds him, refusing to let Jun get too close to Hikaru. But then she says that she has no issue accepting Jun's offer for a free lunch, and she's already picked out the dream meal she wants. A little while later, Hikaru finds himself hiding out in the bathroom, desperate for some alone time. He tells Alma he's at a loss because Aki won't let him get anywhere near Jun. And it's clear Jun knows something about Alma's past, but Aki doesn't seem to care, and if things keep going like this, Hikaru may never get the chance to ask Jun what he knows. Just then an idea strikes Hikaru, and he might have a way to finally get close to Jun after all. Today is the big sports tournament, and Hikaru thinks this might finally be his chance to talk to Jun. But when the moment arrives, Jun is nowhere to be seen. Just then Hikaru gets smacked right in the face with a ball. Turns out, Jun has been watching from a tree the entire time, and he can't believe Hikaru's reaction time is so slow. Even though he's got the strongest mecha, suddenly Jun senses something flying his way, so he dodges and another ball bounces off the tree, ricocheting right onto Hikaru's head, knocking him out cold. The ball was thrown by Aki, but she had meant to hit Jun, so she apologizes to Hikaru for accidentally taking him out. While Hikaru is unconscious, Meru sees her chance to act out one of her wild fantasies. She ties Hikaru up in a ribbon and stages a showdown between Aki and Jun to see who gets to win Hikaru. Aki's down for it, still holding a grudge against Jun for what he did to her, and Jun well, he's always game for a fight. But since Meru's pulling the strings, they agree to settle things with a plain old fistfight. Then we see that Meru is loving every second of the drama, while Alma pleads with Hikaru to find a way to stop Aki, reminding him they still need to talk to Jun. Thinking fast, Hikaru comes up with the only thing that might work, and it's food. He then stands up and yells that if Aki gives him a few minutes alone with Jun, he'll buy her dream meal. Aki gets tempted by the thought of free food, so she agrees and drags Meru off, giving Jun and Hikaru some privacy. Once they're alone, Jun asks what Hikaru wanted to talk about. Hikaru and Alma waste no time, asking if Jun knows anything about Alma's past, since the Kagami group seems so intent on capturing him. Alma then explains that he lost all his memories, so any info Jun has would be super helpful. Jun shocked that the mighty trigger arm has amnesia, tells them that the Kagami group has tons of records on Alma. After all, Alma originally belonged to them. Jun even pulls out a photo as proof, it shows Alma with Yakumo Kagami, the founder of the Kagami group and the one who built this city into what it is today. Hikaru and Alma are stunned, but Jun admits he doesn't know much beyond that, since the photo was taken decades ago, 
As Jun leaves, Aki watches from a bridge with Meru tied up next to her. Then Aki gets a call from the scientist she spoke to earlier, and he's found a lead on the warm type mecha yud user she's been hunting for. A little while later, Hikaru and Alma head to the city library to dig up some info on Yakumo Kagami. Alma can't wrap his head around why everyone here seems to love the Kagami group so much. Considering the awful things they've been doing to Mecha Yud, Hikaru agrees their recent actions have been pretty disgusting, but from the people's point of view, the Kagami group has done a lot to improve the city, so it makes sense they'd be adored. As they search, Hikaru and Alma stumble across a portrait of Yakumo Kagami, and that's when Alma loses it. He breaks down in tears because he knows this person was important to him, but he can't remember a thing about them. Meanwhile across the city, Tenny has just been captured by the warm type mecha user, and Iki's the first to arrive at the scene. But before she can do anything, the mecha has already ripped Karex right out of Tanny's body. It then hurls Tanny at Aki like a ragdoll. And as for Karex, it crushes him until he shatters into pieces. Aki, Sinis, and Dex are enraged, and they all attack the warm user. But it dodges their strikes and gets far enough away to launch something into the gaping hole in Tanny's chest turning him into a puppet under its control, forcing him to fight Aki. As the warm user tries to make its escape, Aki faces a tough choice. Check on Tanny or chase down the warm user. She's desperate to capture it the warm user, so she knocks Tanny out and tears off the warm control device. Hikaru then gets a call about Tanny's condition and rushes over, finding him unconscious in an alleyway. They get Tanny back to headquarters, and thanks to Hikaru's quick actions, Tanny should survive. But as for Karex, there's no saving him. Mecha Yud might be mechanical life forms, but they die just like humans do, and nothing can change that. Originally, they came from another dimension in search of Ordella, the father of all Mecha Yud. With the help of some humans, they managed to find it. But during an experiment to awaken it, something went horribly wrong, so Alma had to use all his power to seal Ordella away, and that's likely what caused his memory loss. The key to Ordella's location lies within Alma's lost memories, and depending on who gets their hands on it, the fate of the world could be at stake. Elsewhere, Iki finally catches up with the Red Girl, demanding to know if she was the one who killed her family and attempts to attack. But when the Red Girl turns around, Aki is stunned because she notices a toy in her hand, and it belongs to her little sister. We then flash back to just before Aki meets her sister. When Aki meets up with Quinn, he tells her that the worm-type user she's hunting is still on the loose. He only discovered this because the incident reports showed someone other than Jun was stripping people of their mecha. This had been going on for months, so Aki became furious and grabs him by the collar demanding why he didn't tell her sooner. Quen tries to defend himself by saying that he didn't know either until now, and the only reason he even found out was by hacking into the ARMS database to help Aki. She then lets him go. But the fact that this info has been in ARMS's database for months means one thing. Algis knew the whole time and decided not to tell her. Quen speculates that Algis was likely investigating these incidents himself, tracking them for eight years now. Just then, an alarm blares so that means that the worm-type user is active again. Eki doesn't hesitate and charges out, ready to confront her arch enemy. The story then shifts back to the present, where Eki confronts the worm type user, who turns out to be her supposedly dead sister Fubuki. Eki gets shocked and flashes back to their childhood, recalling when she and Fubuki would play games with Sinis and Dex, but even then Eki never quite understood the point of this game. Then just as they were playing, her mother called Fubuki from the room because it was her turn for the experiment. Normally Aki would go, but her leg was injured, so Fubuki had to take her place. Fubuki left with a smile, but it was the last time Aki saw her, because moments later the facility exploded in flames, and neither Fubuki nor their parents were ever seen again. That is until now, we're back in the present, with Aki, Sinis, and Dex stunned that Fubuki is alive, and also Fubuki is just as overjoyed to see Aki. Yet her frail coughing shows she's in terrible shape. Fubuki's mecha then emerges, but before she can even fart, Sinis and Dex grab it and slam it into the wall. They have so many unanswered questions, but right now they have to escape because ARMS is on its way. And then we see that by the time the ARMS agents reach the garage, they find nothing but a crack in the wall and one of Aki's broken hair clips. So Algis knows she was there. Outside the garage, Eki still has the worm mecha held hostage, determined to get answers. She demands to know if it was responsible for killing her parents. The mecha tries to explain, saying it was all an accident. But Sinis and Dex won't let it finish because they're convinced that any word that will come out of that screwdriver will be just bullshit. Sinis was there with Fubuki on the day of the incident and clearly remembers the worm mecha attacking everyone. But the only thing he doesn't know is why it did. Fubuki then begs Aki to stop, 
insisting that their parents' deaths weren't Amaryllis's fault. Fubuki blames herself for what happened and apologizes over and over to Akaya, while Amaryllis tries to comfort her. It's clear now there's more to this story than any of them realized. So Sinis and Dex demand Amaryllis tell them exactly what happened that day. On the day of the incident, everything was going as planned. Fubuki had been happily telling her mom about the game she played with Aki, and the experiment was meant to explore the possibility of arbitrium amplification. Amaryllis along with a woman who was united with her at the time, entered to assist. But the instant Amaryllis locked eyes with Fubuki, an unknown phenomenon struck causing both of their arbitrium to resonate wildly. Amaryllis tried to stop it by deresonating with Fubuki, but it only made things worse. Back in the present, Fubuki admits she's wanted to talk to Aki about this for years, but she could never gather the courage, feeling that her parents' deaths were her fault. Amaryllis reassures her it wasn't her fault, but despite Amaryllis's insistence that it was an accident, Aki still blames her, so she ignores Fubuki's pleas and intends to destroy Amaryllis here and now. But under all the stress, Fubuki faints just as Amaryllis had feared might happen. Aki thinks they should get Fubuki to a hospital. But Amaryllis tells her it's useless because after the incident, Fubuki was left with a condition that prevents her from generating her own arbitrium, and no doctor or scientist has been able to help. They've managed her symptoms so far, but at this rate, Fubuki won't last much longer. And according to Amaryllis there's only one way to save Fubuki, but it's going to be incredibly difficult. The next morning, as Hikaru's alarm blares, Alma wakes him, since this is the usual time Aki comes crashing through his window. But today the window remains untouched, and instead, Aki rings the front doorbell. Hikaru and Alma exchange a look Aki never uses the front door, so it's clear something's off, but she doesn't seem ready to talk about it. So Hikaru holds back from asking. Just then Maru bursts in, eager to ask them something, with a big test coming up. She suggests they all have a group study session, including Jun who's been lurking nearby spying on Hikaru all morning. Meru heads over and asks if he'd like to join, but Jun scoffs and claims that he didn't come to this school for something as pointless as studying. Meru just ignores this shit talk like it never comes out of his mouth and shouts back to Hikaru, asking if they can hold the study session at his house. Hikaru mulls it over, and sure he'd like to hang out with Meru, but he knows Aki and Jun will probably clash and the last thing he needs is a showdown in his house. He tries talking Meru out of it, but she won't budge, even asking Aki to back her up. Aki declines politely, but Maru keeps pushing, saying it's the perfect excuse to visit Hikaru's house. But Aki says that she has been going to his house every morning, so the idea doesn't excite her, and this just makes Meru start daydreaming again about how far their rom-com has progressed. Aki then walks off, and Hikaru follows, sensing something's bothering her, though she refuses to say what. Meanwhile back at arms, one of the scientists frustrated with being out of the loop, heads over to Quen's workstation, asking if he knows anything about Aki's whereabouts, as she hasn't been to headquarters lately. Quen initially plays dumb, but after he gets to test some unique persuasion, he confesses he might have something to do with Aki's current situation. Meanwhile, Aki sits beside her ailing sister as Amaryllis explains how they've managed to keep Fubuki alive so far. Since Fubuki can't generate her own arbitrium, Amaryllis has been siphoning Arbitrium from other mecha users to feed it to her. But Fubuki's illness is advancing too quickly now for Amaryllis to keep up, and with little time left before her condition turns critical, Amaryllis urges Aki to do whatever it takes to save her sister. And of course the only way Aki can guarantee Fubuki's survival is by taking Hikaru's poor life. Then we see that at the same time across the city, all the mecha users that Amaryllis infected both from ARMS and the Kagami group begin lashing out in violent fits without warning like zombies. Alji seems to have an idea of what might be behind it, so he orders all available ARMS agents into the field to restrain the rogue mecha users, while Kagami gives the same directive to their group. Later that evening, Meru, Jun, and Hikaru are heading to his place to study. But as they're walking, Hikaru gets an urgent message from Algis, so he quickly cancels on them and runs off in the opposite direction. Soon after, he arrives at ARMS headquarters, where Algis apologizes for calling him in on such short notice but explains there's a crisis. Dozens of mecha users have suddenly spiraled out of control, and Algis suspects the worm-type mecha user is responsible. He even has footage of Eki making friendly contact with this worm user, which raises suspicions that Eki might somehow be involved. So if Algis is right, that would mean she's betrayed both humanity and the mecha kind. For now, he plans to capture her for questioning, but given her strength, they may have to use force to bring her down. Alma and Hikaru can hardly believe Algis suspects Eki because she's one of their own, but Algis points out that the organization can't run on feelings alone. And also the only reason Aki joined ARMS was because her goals aligned with theirs. 
so if her goals have changed, there's nothing to keep her from betraying them. Hikaru refuses to believe Aki would ever turn against them, so he races off to find her before Arms does, hoping to figure out what's really going on. That's the plan at least. But on his way he runs into Quinn, who reminds him that he has no clue where to start looking. But luckily Quinn has thought it through, and has come up with a foolproof plan to track Aki down, and it involves this idiot. Hikaru immediately recognizes this Goofy as Wanner, the guy who tried to kill him a few days ago. It's clear Wanner doesn't want to be here, but he doesn't have much of a choice. And before they can even discuss their plan, Wanner's mecha emerges and starts profusely apologizing for Wanner's action. Hikaru's confused because he thought Wanner's mecha was supposed to be brainwashed. But after Wanner's capture, Arms managed to remove the shackles and free Keijimaru. Quen was reluctant to let Keijimaru relink with Wanner, but with no other options and since Keijimaru insisted, he allowed it. Keijimaru then declares he's going to teach Wanner what it truly means to fight for justice and that Wanner's going to learn, even if he has to beat it into his skull. Forcing Wanner down onto his knees, Keijimaru makes him apologize, with Wanner swearing to Hikaru and Alma that the two of them will be valuable on this mission. Out in town a while later, Keijimaru is scanning every inch for Akai. But Wanner keeps whining about wanting to go home, which gets on Keijimaru's last nerve, so he snaps at him to work harder, if he's serious about atoning for his past mistakes. Hikaru and Alma are starting to doubt if this is even the best way to find a key, but Keijimaru reassures them, saying it's only a matter of time before they'll track her down soon, thanks to the acoustic sonar that's picking up the resonant frequency of her arbitrium. Just then Hikaru is ambushed from behind, but Keijimaru shields him out of danger just in time. The attacker turns out to be Jun, who's clearly sick of Hikaru avoiding him. He declares he won't leave Hikaru alone until he figures out the secret behind Hikaru's powers. With Jun likely tagging along now, Alma asks if he's down to help them search for a key. But since Jun has never been a fan of a key, he scoffs questioning why he'd want to help. So Alma determined to get his help, promises to spill some of Hikaru's secrets at the study session if Jun agrees. Jun takes the bait, and word of this gets back to Taudu, who informs Jun's brother, asking if he should send someone to keep an eye on Jun. But Jun's brother doesn't give a damn about Jun's safety, insisting that the company's priorities come first, so he won't be sending anyone to babysit him. Meanwhile, Keijimaru has tracked Aki's arbitrium to a parking garage. The signal is strong, so he's convinced she must be close. But when they reach the source they're faced with Aki herself, who looks dead set on following Amaryllis's advice if it means saving her sister. Elsewhere, Fubuki becomes suddenly energized, eagerly asking Amaryllis if her sister will be alright. Amaryllis assures her, telling her not to worry because Aki loves her. So Fubuki with a smile shakes her head and says that Aki better save her this time. Hikaru and Alma are both uneasy about Aki, wondering if she's tangled up in something involving the worm user. Just as LG's hinted, when they press her about it, she shuts them down and says she needs Hikaru to come with her. Hikaru agrees because he trusts her, but he demands to know what's going on. Yet even though he's already agreed to help, Aki leaps into the air and attacks him out of nowhere, completely blindsided. Hikaru is about to get knocked out when Jun intervenes, stepping in to defend him. Though Jun doesn't particularly like Hikaru, he's sworn to be the one to take him down, and there's no way he's letting Aki beat him to it. Aki tries to fight her way past Jun, but his sheer strength outclasses hers by a mile, so within moments he has her restrained. That's when Hikaru steps up, firmly telling Jun to let Aki go. Sure she attacked him first, but Hikaru insists she must have a good reason. He pleads with her to calm down and talk to him, saying he doesn't know what she's going through, but he is willing to help if she'll just explain. Aki hesitates unsure of what to say, but that's when Sinis and Dex chime in, revealing the truth. Aki's sister Fubuki is still alive but gravely ill due to a lack of arbitrium. She needs an enormous amount to survive, and Aki has been desperately searching for a way to save her. According to Amaryllis, Hikaru might have enough arbitrium in his body to cure Fubuki, given his ability to awaken Alma. But as soon as the name Amaryllis comes up, Jun starts laughing. He claims he knows exactly what's happening. The Kagami group's extensive records on Amaryllis leave him confident that Amaryllis is controlling Fubuki, likely holding her hostage. Sinis and Dex don't buy it and angrily argue with him, but Hikaru silences everyone. Despite everything he declares he's still willing to go with Aki because after all they're friends. Aki is stunned because this is the first time Hikaru has ever called her his friend. But before the moment lingers too long, Alma chimes in reminding everyone there's still a special meal to hit after all this chaos. So the quicker they help Akai, the quicker they can all dig in. Jun grows visibly frustrated, feeling like no one listened when he made it clear that Amaryllis is trying to trick them. He refuses to let Hikaru go. But Hikaru shakes him off and tells him he has no right to interfere. 
and then he looks to Aki while extending his hand, ready to help her save Fubuki. However, as Aki looks at him and remembers how kind he's always been to her, she realizes she can't go through with her plan to sacrifice him. Instead she steps back, telling Hikaru she doesn't need his help. There have to be other ways to save Fubuki, and she's not going to drag an outsider like him into her family problem. To push him further away, she coldly says they're not friends and he shouldn't act so familiar with her. With that she turns and leaves to return to Fubuki, and Hikaru is left confused. But Jun just shakes his head, muttering that Aki is an idiot for not realizing Amaryllis is clearly evil. Meanwhile, the two scientists are hard at work digging through data and manage to uncover files on Amaryllis in the Kagami Group's database. The documents reveal that Amaryllis once went berserk, causing the deaths of everyone involved in the experiment, Fubuki included. There's certain Amaryllis is behind all of this, but can't figure out why she's suddenly become active after so much time. They don't have many leads, but they believe they might find answers by analyzing lip movement from the day Aki encountered the worm user. Back with Aki, she returns to Fubuki and Amaryllis. Seeing that Hikaru isn't with her, Amaryllis demands an explanation. Aki admits Hikaru won't be coming, leaving Amaryllis visibly shocked and upset. She questions why Aki is backing out of their arrangement, especially now. Aki tries to justify her decision, saying she doesn't want to involve outsiders and believes they can solve this as a family. But Fubuki's response is anything but understanding. She accuses Aki of caring more about Hikaru than her own sister, throwing guilt and venom her way, and says that if Aki truly loved her, she'd have no problem sacrificing Hikaru to save her. Fubuki even brings up the past, asking if Aki is going to abandon her again and let her die like before. You'd almost think someone called the fire department with all this gaslighting, but Aki blinded by her love for her sister, doesn't notice anything is off. Instead she offers herself as a replacement, volunteering to become Fubuki's arbitrium battery in Hikaru's place. At the same time, Alma is trying to convince Hikaru to go after Aki, but Hikaru hesitates, feeling he has no right to interfere. Aki clearly said she didn't need his help and her quest for revenge is something he can't relate to, so he doesn't want to impose or risk getting in her way. Meanwhile, Jun has been minding his own business, uninterested in Eki's fate, but when he hears Hikaru say he doesn't want to interfere, it strikes a nerve, reminding him of the regret he felt about his own brother. Suddenly, Jun becomes deeply invested in pushing Hikaru to act, grabbing him by the collar. Jun demands he stop wallowing in self-pity and make a choice, either let Aki go or stay by her side. Faced with this challenge, Hikaru admits he still wants to save Aki. Encouraged by this realization, Alma tells him that being an outsider doesn't matter. What matters is how he feels. Hikaru has always been the type who can't ignore someone in trouble, and now is no different. With their course of action set, Alma enlists Wanner and Keijimaru to track Aki down. Keijimaru agrees enthusiastically, but Wanner still whining like an annoying kid who just wants to go home. Meanwhile, back at arms, Quinn has uncovered a startling truth. The worm user is none other than Eki's sister Fubuki. The revelation makes no sense to him, as all records indicate that Fubuki is dead. Adding to the confusion, why would she suddenly appear now? But before Quinn can make sense of it, Algis shows up behind him and casually says that Amaryllis has returned, and she's after Hikaru's arbitrium. Quen is shocked not just by the revelation, but also by the fact that Algis had been standing there the whole time. Algis unfazedly explains that Amaryllis resurfaced after learning that Alma had awakened, and he'd been trying to resolve the situation in secret before it escalated. But his secrecy backfired. He didn't think Aki could handle the truth about her sister being puppeteered by Amaryllis. But by keeping her in the dark, he unintentionally pushed Aki right into Amaryllis' manipulative grasp. Back with Aki and Amaryllis, the facade finally drops. Amaryllis frustrated that Eki didn't deliver Hikaru after all the effort she put into impersonating Fubuki, decides she's done playing nice. She mocks Eki for taking so long to figure out the truth and announces her plan to get rid of her using her puppet. Eki now realizing the real Fubuki would never behave like this, prepares to defend herself. Amaryllis calls her an idiot for being so slow to catch on and launches her attack. Eki manages to hold her own against the puppets for a while. But Amaryllis switches tactics, pretending to act like Fubuki again to catch Aki off guard. And the moment Aki hesitates, Amaryllis seizes the opportunity to restrain her. With Aki in her grasp, Amaryllis reveals that although she intended to keep Fubuki's body as her host for a while longer, having Aki here is just too convenient, so she might as well take over her body too. But before she can act, Sinis and Dex intervene, grabbing Amaryllis to stop her. But Amaryllis knows she has the upper hand and she gleefully reminds Aki that destroying her would mean hurting Fubuki as well. Then, with chilling cruelty, she recounts how Aki and Fubuki's parents begged her to release Fubuki's body when she first took it over, 
but Amaryllis refused to let go of such a perfect puppet and killed their parents with her own hands. And Aki is left reeling completely shattered by the revelation. Sensing her despair, Amaryllis moves in to finish her off and take her body. Just as things seem hopeless, Hikaro and Jun crash through the window. Sending Amaryllis tumbling to the ground, Aki shocked and furious, yells at Hikaro for coming here. Knowing full well that Amaryllis is after him, but Hikaro brushes her concerns aside, declaring he doesn't care about the danger because he's here to save his friend. With Hikaro now in the room, Amaryllis switches her focus and lunges at him. But before she can lay a finger on him, Jun steps in her path and blocks her. He then smirks and says there's no way he's letting anyone touch Hikaro, except for him of course. Aki panickedly tries to stop Jun, pleading with him not to hurt Fubuki in the process. But Jun doesn't care about Fubuki at all because his only goal is to make sure Amaryllis doesn't kill Hikaro, no matter the cost. Just then, Amaryllis grabs Jun and hurls him aside like yesterday's trash to get to Hikaro. But even as he's tossed away, Jun refuses to back down, activating his mecha to restrain her. Amaryllis finds his attempt laughable, mocking him for thinking he can take her on with a cheap knockoff of her own abilities. She sneers, saying it's fitting that a failure like him pilots a mecha just as useless as he is. Jun is visibly offended, but before he can retort, Amaryllis silences him by covering his mouth and resumes her assault on Hikaru. Alma steps in to block the attack, but every time Amaryllis strikes him, he feels his power draining away, realizing how dangerous it will be to keep fighting if she can sap their strength. Aki steps in front of Hikaru to shield him. Amaryllis taunts her, asking if she still thinks she's fit to act as Hikaru's bodyguard after everything she's done. But Aki calmly states she isn't protecting Hikaru as a bodyguard. She's doing it because he's her friend and she cares about him. That might sound noble, but Amaryllis points out the harsh reality. As long as she's using Fubuki's body, Aki can't lay a finger on her without risking her sister's life. So that makes Aki dead weight in this fight. True to her words, Amaryllis captures Aki with ease leaving Hikaru to fend for himself. To his credit, he holds his ground remarkably well. But Amaryllis begins using Aki as a human shield. The distraction gives her an opening to strike, and she stabs Hikaru with one of her tentacles. Once she's inside him, she starts draining his arbitrium. As she suspected, Hikaru's arbitrium matches the legendary energy from 100 years ago. Hearing this, Alma feels a strange sense that something important happened back then, though his memories are hazy. Noticing his confusion Amaryllis smirks, realizing the rumors about Alma losing his memories are true, and for some reason this discovery enraged her and she stabs Hikaro again, greedily pulling more Arbitrium from him. With her prize secured, Amaryllis decides she no longer needs Aki and begins strangling her to death. Aki pleads for help, and in response, Hikaro's body surges with Arbitrium, overflowing with energy. Amaryllis is overjoyed, thrilled by the sheer amount of power coursing into her because it's more than she's ever had before. But Hikaro and Alma keep charging the Arbitrium and pushing it past its limits. So the overwhelming energy overloads Amaryllis' systems, throwing her into chaos. And while Amaryllis flounders under the surge of power, Hikaro and Alma seize the moment to free Aki. And as they do a blinding flash of light erupts engulfing everything around them. When the dust finally settles, Hikaro, Aki, and Jun find themselves sprawled on the ground, unsure of what just happened. The one thing Jun knows for sure is that he's not letting Amaryllis get away with what she said to him. Fueled by pure spite he springs to his feet, grabs Amaryllis with his mecha, and begins ripping her out of Fubuki's body. Amaryllis fights back, but Jun's sheer pettiness fuels him to overpower her and forcibly separate her from Fubuki. Once free, Fubuki regains control of her body, and Aki is overwhelmed with relief to see her sister safe again. But Amaryllis isn't out of tricks yet. Even without her primary host, she still controls a swarm of puppets and tries to use them to capture Aki. This time though without Fubuki as a human shield, Aki fights back with ease, Hikaru steps in next, and with Alma's help, they finally defeat Amaryllis. As she's destroyed, her parting words leave a chilling mark. She blames Alma for her downfall, claiming it's his fault because he caused Yakumo Kagami's death. The next morning, life seems to return to normal, or at least as normal as it gets, as Aki makes her usual dramatic entrance by crashing through Hikaru's newly repaired window, and the two head to school together. On the way, Iki apologizes for all the trouble she caused him, but Hikaru ever the good friend brushes it off, reminding her that helping each other out is what friends are for. Encouraged by his words, Iki mentions she has another favor to ask. She wants Hikaru to help her study. Hikaru is baffled, pointing out that she already missed all the tests, so what's the point? Aki explains her real motivation. She wants to catch up on schoolwork so she can help Fubuki relearn everything she missed during the eight years she was under Amaryllis' control. 
Fubuki is currently in physical therapy, regaining her strength with arms taking care of her. Eiki has decided to stay with the organization and promises to continue guarding Hikaru 24-7. While Hikaru is glad to have her around again, he insists she doesn't need to shadow him quite that much. Meanwhile, at the Kagami Group Research Lab, the construction of a gate to the Mecha Yud world is finally complete, and once activated the gate will allow them to take control of all dormant mechas. However to power the gate, they need the Ordella, and the only one capable of activating it is Alma. Determined to capture him, the group prepares to use any means necessary. Back at Hikaro's house, Alma continues to wrestle with questions about his unrevealed past. Elsewhere, Amaryllis now desperate and adrift without a host, yearns to return to her body. Her despair is interrupted by the arrival of a mysterious figure, so she panically pleads and swears that she never betrayed him. But her words fall on deaf ears as the man coldly rips her from the host body she had been clinging to, leaving her in shreds. The next morning, on the way to school, Hikaro's friends are lurking behind a corner, watching him nervously because there are two suspicious people have appeared and started pestering him and Aki. But turns out these two are arms agents, sent as backup bodyguards for Hikaro, because since Aki hasn't been entirely successful at keeping Hikaro safe, she has no say in rejecting their help, because this order came straight from arms headquarters. By sheer bad luck, Kazuya happens to be nearby. After failing miserably at capturing Hikaro before, He's been stripped of his mecha and demoted to lowly security guard duty. Spotting Hikaro now feels like fate handing him a shot at redemption, so he is now determined to reclaim his honor and tries to arrest Hikaro. But before he can, Aki grabs Hikaro's hand and leaps off the bridge with him, landing on the back of a moving truck. The truck driver, oblivious to two teenagers crashing onto his vehicle, keeps driving as if nothing happened. Meanwhile, Hikaro is thoroughly unimpressed with how his morning is turning out. Alma then apologizes for disrupting Hikaro's once normal life, but Hikaro reassures him, saying they're in this together. Whatever madness comes their way, they'll face it side by side, at least until Alma can recover his memory. Speaking of which, Alma has something important to tell Hikaro, but before he gets the chance, they're interrupted by Sinis and Dex. The two are locked in a heated argument about whether honey or jam makes a better breakfast topping. Ironically, they're trying to whip up breakfast for Hikaro and Aki while riding on the truck to the school. But Hikaro says that the truck isn't headed toward school at all. In fact, he has no clue where this vehicle is going. But before they can figure it out, the truck jerks to a stop, and the driver collapses, knocked out by a blow dart. Then we see some members of the Kagami group arrive to capture Hikaro, including the third division head Namba, the psycho girl who looks like Jinx, named Fort, and some new guy nobody knows. Namba clearly doesn't want to be there, so he tells his subordinates to hurry up and get it done. And that's all the fuel Jinx needs because she immediately unleashes a barrage of spikes at Hikaro with her shackled mecha Yud machine gun. Eki reacts quickly, grabbing Hikaro and ducking behind a truck as Fort riddles it with bullets, while the poor truck driver definitely will not make it out of this shit alive. While Eki staying calm under fire, tells Hikaro to leave this to her and run to school before he gets marked absent. Hikaro reluctantly agrees and starts running, until Kazuya appears out of nowhere and blocks his path. Meanwhile, Oyama and Kayano are pinned down by Hikaro's friends due to some massive misunderstanding, so they're officially useless for now. Kazuya looking deadly serious, declares that he's capturing Hikaro to atone for his own failures. But just as things get tense, the new guy from the 3rd division interrupts, climbing on top of the truck and claiming he'll handle capturing Hikaro. But things then get juicy when Kazuya notices the new guy's mecha is the very one stripped from him when he was demoted, and he wants it back so damn bad. So right before the new guy can attack Hikaro, Kazuya lunges at him, wrestling him down in a desperate attempt to reclaim his stolen mecha. Amidst this chaos, Eki yells at Hikaro to stop gawking and keep running to school. He takes off again, only to nearly trip over the unconscious body of the new guy. Turning around, he sees that Kazuya has his mecha back and is now gunning for him. Meanwhile, Eki sneaks up on Fort, trying to take her down, but she dodges just in time. Almost effortlessly, she lines up the perfect shot with her minigun, ready to end Eki. But in a freak accident, she leaps backward into Kazuya, knocking him over. Fort furiously screams at Kazuya for getting in her way, so Kazuya equally ticked off yells right back, calling her out for bumping into him with her edgy eye patch. Once she gets off him, he goes straight back to attacking Hikaro, but Hikaro leaps into the air to avoid it. While airborne, he and Alma snap into full battle mode. Kazuya then takes another swing with his whip, but Hikaro and Alma dodge smoothly, grabbing the chain mid-swing and hurling Kazuya straight into Fort knocking them both to the ground. Fort looks absolutely mortified now that Kazuya is sitting on her, 
and as the two awkwardly fumble through the situation, Aki sneaks up behind them and knocks them both out cold, seeing his team completely wipe. The division head figures he's done his part for the day, so he casually clocks out, tossing a half-hearted request to Tuz to pick up the new guy and fort later, if she feels like it. Because frankly, he doesn't care whether they get captured or not. Meanwhile, Aki and Hikaru are busy tying everyone up, and Alma mentions he's got something important to share with Hikaru. But before he can get it out, Aki calls for help. Having managed to tangle herself up in the ropes like a total amateur, Hikaru rushes over to help. But while he's distracted untangling her, Kazuya staggers to his feet and aims for a cheap shot from behind. Alma spots it in time and blocks the attack, but Hikaru still takes a spill and manages to knock himself unconscious in the process. When Hikaru finally wakes up, everything is under control. The Kagami group members are secured, but Alma is visibly upset, blaming himself for Hikaru's injury. Hikaru tries to reassure him, insisting it wasn't his fault, but Alma stubbornly believes Hikaru would be safer without him around, and declares that he doesn't want anyone else hurt because of him, leaving Hikaru puzzled. Sensing something deeper, Hikaru asks if Alma has regained his memory, and Alma hesitates but eventually confirms it. Hikaru thinks this is good news, but Alma then spells that he has his memories back since the fight with Amaryllis and that makes Hikaru confused because Alma kept it a secret and didn't say anything. Alma then stumbles over his words but eventually decides that Hikaru doesn't need to get involved, and without another word, he starts crawling away dramatically. Normally, Aki would chase Alma down to keep him from doing anything reckless, but she shrugs it off this time, reasoning that Alma can't get more than 5 meters from Hikaru without losing power. But shockingly Alma isn't losing power, and to everyone's surprise he's ridiculously fast for an arm. And before they know it, both Hikaru and Aki have completely lost track of him. Back at arms, Algis informs Hikaru that Alma must have regained his memories after encountering Amaryllis, so Hikaru wonders how Alma can suddenly move on his own. So Fist steps in to explain that Alma once had a unique ability to generate his own arbitrium, and now that his memories are back, so is that ability. This revelation catches everyone off guard and naturally they demand to know why something so important was kept under wraps. Fist has a solid reason though, bringing up Alma's traumatic past prematurely could have caused him to shut down entirely, and no one wanted to risk that. Regardless, the priority now is finding Alma, so Algis instructs everyone to keep an eye out for him, but when Hikaru eagerly offers to help, Algis dismisses him saying that since Alma can move on his own, Hikaru's involvement isn't necessary anymore. This blunt remark stuns both Hikaru and Quen, while Quen sees the silver lining and suggests that Hikaru can now return to his normal life, but Hikaru isn't having it. After everything he's been through with Alma, there's no way he can just go back to being an ordinary civilian, so his refusal to back down forces Algis and Fist to relent and spill the full truth. Back in the Mecha Yud world, things were dire. Their planet had almost entirely run out of Arbitrium, pushing the Mecha Yudes to the brink of extinction. Alma, Fist, and another companion set out on a desperate mission to locate the legendary Ordella, which was said to have the power to restore their home. However, their journey was cut short when they became inactive due to a lack of energy. Fortunately, they managed to crash land on Earth before shutting down completely. On the night of their arrival, Yakumo Kagami happens to be nearby, and he gets curious about the strange light emanating from his family's minds. So he goes to investigate, and that's when he stumbled upon Alma. But not long after, a cave-in happened that would have killed Yakumo if he had been alone, but Alma fused with him just in time, allowing them to escape. Then we see that Fist fused with Yakumo's older brother Sakito, who was suffering from a mysterious disease linked to Arbitrium. So Sakito agreed to join the Mecha Yudes in their quest for Ordella, hoping to find a cure for himself, and Yakumo joined in too because he was looking for the excitement. They all started searching for Ordella together, and after finally finding it, they dove headfirst into their research to activate it. Days stretched on, tension mounting as they neared the culmination of their work. Eventually the moment arrived for their efforts to bear fruit. But Yakumo couldn't shake the feeling that things were going a little too smoothly. Tsukido acknowledged Yakumo's concerns but reassured him that all their test values fell neatly within expectations. Nothing could possibly go wrong, or so he thought. The following day, during the critical process of awakening Ordella, everything went straight to hell. Despite all of Tsukido's rigorous tests, he'd never stopped to consider the aftermath of bringing such a powerful yet unfriendly force to life. The moment Ordella awoke, it lashed out violently, knocking Tsukido and Fist unconscious and severely injuring Yakumo. Alma by some miracle, was the only one left unscathed, but then panic began to take over him as he wondered what he could do against a monster like Ordella. But Yakumo wasn't about to let a little thing like a near-fatal head wound keep him from stepping up. He steadied Alma, assuring him they'd figure it out together, 
The two prepared for a fight, though Yakumo's words of confidence couldn't change the fact that Ordella was an absolute beast. Getting close enough to land a blow would require some next-level creativity. Yakumo slammed his fist into the ground, sending chunks of rock flying everywhere to distract Ordella. And while Ordella was dealing with the barrage, Yakumo and Alma launched themselves from above, landing a devastating punch that managed to reseal it. Victory came at a steep cost though. Yakumo collapsed moments later, and his injuries claimed his life. The trauma of losing Yakumo shattered Alma, so he withdrew into himself, never waking from his grief until he crossed paths with Hikaru. But now with his memories flooding back, Alma is desperate not to let Hikaru meet the same fate. In his guilt-ridden mind, the only solution is to get as far away from Hikaru as possible. While dragging himself into an alley to escape, Alma stumbles into Jun, and without hesitation Jun grabs Alma and tries to fuse with him. But no matter how hard he pushes, it's just not happening. So Jun feels defeated and shrugs it off, accepting that maybe he's just not ready for such a fusion yet. But something about Alma's crushed expression gnaws at him. So Jun gets closer and asks what the hell happened. At the same time, Hikaru stands at the edge of a bridge, lost in thought and looking like the weight of the world is crushing him. Then suddenly he gets a call from Jun. But when Hikaru answers, he doesn't hear Jun's voice. It's Alma on the line. Alma starts talking about the day they first met, reminiscing about how despite knowing nothing about him, Hikaru chose to help. Alma acknowledges Hikaru's incredible kindness, but makes it clear he can't keep relying on it. He insists he's capable of managing on his own now and urges Hikaru to let things go back to how they were before they met, to return to his normal life. Hikaru is utterly confused so he tries to reason with Alma, but Alma's already made up his mind and he ends. The call abruptly, he plans to stick with Jun for a while, but just as Jun steps out of the alleyway, Taudu appears, and he's clearly not here for a friendly chat. Back on the bridge, Hikaru is still spiraling, questioning everything when Aki shows up and bluntly asks if he's found Alma yet. Hikaru feeling defeated, tells her it's pointless to keep searching because Alma doesn't need him anymore. But before he can finish, Aki punches him square in the face. She immediately apologizes claiming she tried to hold back, but she couldn't listen to him talk like that. Aki knows Alma is only acting this way because he's tormented by his past. She understands what it's like to carry the crushing weight of guilt, which is exactly why she knows Alma needs someone by his side right now. Even if Hikaru thinks Alma doesn't need him anymore, Aki does, and she begs him to help bring Alma back. Hikaru realizing she's absolutely right, finally agrees. But just as they're about to move, Aki gets a call from ARMS headquarters because Alma has been captured by the Kagami group, and they're planning to use him to unseal Ordella. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.